Avenue Nolgeta. Um, so this particular topic I'm going to talk about uh, climate and sustainability reporting will sound very new to a lot of you, uh, but it's something that is uh, getting traction and momentum uh, globally. And in some developed markets, it's something that's already been uh, established and legislated, and companies are required to comply with these reporting standards. Uh, before I go ahead, I guess I just want to acknowledge the presence um, of the Honorable um, Governor and uh, State Ministers in the room, and also thank Kumu Petroleum Holdings and MD Wapusong for putting together um, such an exciting conference um, and for continuing investing in this particular sector um, in PNG. Um, like I said, climate and sustainability reporting is gaining traction globally, and you might, you, 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 you're probably sitting there and asking yourself, okay, what are we going to hear from an accountant uh, this afternoon? But uh, just give me your ears for a few seconds. So climate and sustainability reporting is really about bringing credibility to how organizations manage sustainability and climate risks and how organizations measure and report on greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, let me talk about some of the big trends uh, as it relates to the particular conference that we are uh, here these couple of days. We're talking about decarbonization. Uh, we know that the world we live in is warming up, and it's because of the uh, uh, CO2 that we generate for the diff within the different uh, activities that we engage in as human beings. Um, so climate change is really about reducing that carbon footprint. Uh, we're talking about investing in climate, uh, uh, in clean energy. And uh, yesterday we talked a lot about the energy uh, transition. Again, it's all about decarbonizing the planet and making sure that we can reduce um, global warming. Now, there's been a lot of uh, talk uh, by uh, especially the petroleum and energy industry around the steps and actions that they're taking to reduce greenhouse emissions. Um, and there's also skepticism around that talk. The numbers that are put out, the plans that are put out, you know, you hear terms like greenwashing. Um, you hear that, you know, some of the targets are not achievable, you know, because people are just putting out targets for the sake of putting out targets. So as a result, there's been a global push to hold companies and corporates to account to make sure that the targets that they're setting to reduce the carbon footprint are appropriate. Uh, everyone is using the same... Uh, this, the same framework, and everyone is reporting. So, you know, one of the things that I like as an accountant is you can't fix what you can't measure. So if you don't have a way of measuring something, how do you know that you're actually improving? So the climate and sustainability reporting is about ensuring that when we measure something, we're measuring using a global baseline that we all agree is the right baseline, and then we can track year on year how we are doing in terms of decarbonizing the world uh, we live in. I'm sure some of you are thinking, ah, oh, this doesn't impact me. This is for petroleum and energy companies. Uh, but let me assure you, this regime of climate and sustainability reporting applies to everyone. It applies to every company. Uh, it's now in effect globally from the 1st of January 2024. And us accountants are getting excited because we get to talk to you about it. Um, and, you know, I've got one of my uh, counselors from uh, CPAPNG, James Gore, and we spend quite a lot of time uh, talking about this and how uh, it's important. Think of it this way. We all know financial reporting. We, know, we all know financial statements. If you're an investor, if you want to buy shares, you go and look at a set of financial statements for a company to assess its financial health. You look at the financial statements, you see who's done, if they've been audited, there's a tick. If the audit has been done by a big four, another big tick. So you, you get credibility by holding a set of financial statements that has been signed off by a big four. Uh, if, if you were here yesterday, um, we had the chairman of TWL, uh, Larry Andagali, talking about Simple thing, he was talking about 
governance of the TWL group and how each year Santos uh, have a scorecard for TWL where they have to check basic things. Are you paying your superannuation on time? Are you paying your GST on time? But one of the things that he was really proud of, if you recall, if you're here yesterday, is he was proud that uh, TWL has got their accounts audited and they are up to date. And he put something up on the screen, you might not have realized, but that was an audit report from PwC. So it gives credibility to the company around the financial information that it is providing around the numbers that it is giving to the market. You know, if you walk into a bank and you want a loan, you're a big company and you want a loan, the first thing that they will ask you, can we see your numbers? Can you show us your financial statements? Have they been audited? Are they up to date? A couple of years from now, banks are going to ask you, do you have climate and sustainability reporting embedded within your organization? Can I see the statement where you measure emissions. We think it's too far down the track, but this is what banks are starting to ask for. You know, the push to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions um, has resulted in shareholder and societal shifts in how capital is deployed. And I'll go through one example right at the end, just to give you an, an idea of what that actually means and what's actually happening in practice. So big banks, big super funds who are, who are responsible for at least 90% of the capital flows in the world and even here in PNG are now requiring companies to show that they've got climate and sustainability reporting embedded within their operations. And I've got a few clients globally, even here in PNG, who are struggling to get finance because they can't demonstrate that they've got ESG embedded within their organization. They can't demonstrate that they are on top of climate and sustainability uh, requirements. So it is really a big thing, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go through all of my slides, lest I bore you, but I'll cover off on, on some of the uh, big ticket items. Uh, this is the agenda um, that I'll go through. So I know, I know we've, we, we've, we've heard about ESG, and I'm not gonna bore you on the topic, because that's a conference on its own, and ESG has got a lot of Faces to it, you know, environmental, social, and government, and, and sorry, and governance. You can see from the screen there that there's a plethora of areas that ESG touches on. So climate and sustainability reporting is just one aspect of ESG, but it's becoming one of the more important um, aspects uh, of ESG. Because in climate and sustainability reporting, we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, the E, and reducing them reporting on how as an organization you're managing your footprint when it comes to greenhouse gases. We're talking about the G, the accounting standards around how you measure and disclose and report those greenhouse gas emissions. The reporting landscape is actually very crowded in this space. There's varying uh, standards, there's varying organizations and institutes that are putting a lot of pressure on organizations to report on their greenhouse gas emissions. I'm not gonna talk through the stride, but the top right quadrant is what I'm gonna focus on uh, in the next few minutes around corporates, so the private sector, listed companies, banks, superannuation funds. What are the sustainability and climate related reporting requirements uh, impacting these particular group of companies. So you will see that the key drivers for ESG reporting or climate and sustainability reporting, really, there's a couple of questions that we're trying to answer. What is the company's environmental impact and sustainability performance? What is the financial impact of climate-related risks on these businesses? Like I said, you might be sitting there thinking, now nah, this is far-fetched, this doesn't apply to me. I can tell you it applies to you today. It was effective from the 1st of January 2024. So as a PNG homegrown company or whether you're a global MNC, these requirements touch you. If you're a bank, a financial institution, a superannuation fund, and you want to be able to deploy capital in the future, these are the questions you need to be able to ask, answer. How does my company manage climate-related risks 
and opportunities. You know, I know of some companies that can't get contracts because all they don't have is an ESG policy. All they don't have is an ability to measure the emissions that they are generating because of their activities. And number four, how is the company aligned with international sustainability goals and standards, which is what I'll touch on in the next bit. So you saw this slide, there's so much out there, so much to worry about. But this afternoon, I'm just gonna touch on one particular standard uh, that will help you understand this particular uh, uh, terrain and what you need to do on a go forward basis. And that is that wood um, is accelerating the adoption and acceptance of literature in regards to climate and sustainability reporting. So that is the framework that applies to PNG. That is the framework that applies globally. That is the framework that your companies will need to comply with. Uh, from the 1st of January 2024. I think as PNG, we're trying to look for ways to maybe push that out uh, a few years down the track because we are not really ready to adopt these standards. But I'll talk about them in a bit. So the IASB is the International Sustainability Standards Board. They've issued two standards. Uh, over time, they will issue more standards. There's S1 and S2. Those are the two standards you have to worry about. S1 and S2. S1 talks about general requirements for disclosure for sustainability related financial information. It asks you to talk about how are you managing climate risks within your organization? What governance do you have in place? What risk management do you have in place? People, resources, processes. That's S1. S2, on the other hand, is about climate-related disclosures. You need to be able to measure the greenhouse gas emissions that your, company, your company's activities is contributing to the environment. The greenhouse gas emissions are split into three. There's scope one, scope two, and scope three. So you need to be able to measure those group of greenhouse gas emissions, scope one, scope two, and scope three. And I'll touch on that uh, in, the next, in the next bit, just what does that actually look like and how do you go about uh, doing it? So before the ISSB standards were there, um, a lot of P&G companies, some of the global MNCs were complying with what was called the TCFD framework, which is the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. So the TSD framework has existed for a number of years, and a lot of companies were complying with this TCFD. This is a busy slide, but if you can take anything from it, is the TCFD um, had different guidelines. The ISSB has got more guidelines. So it's better that you just comply with, uh, with the ISSB. Now, in PNG, what have I observed, what have we observed, is that these standards are rapidly evolving um, around the globe, and we can't sit back and say, I don't know, it's happening in the developed, nation, in the developed world, therefore this, this doesn't apply to us. Uh, Australia deferred its application by one year, and from 1 January 2025 has, has, put, has made it mandatory for companies to apply uh, the new sustainability standards, S1 and S2. For PNG, CPA PNG is pushing the charge and hasn't adopted it fully. And there's a recommendation for the adoption of the sustainability standards in PNG to maybe be deferred for a few years. When I said that they are applicable to PNG today, I saw a few faces, uh, jaws drop. What that tells me is that we are not ready. So there is no point uh, forcing the implementation of this standard now when we are not ready as a nation. So we need to make sure we take a considered approach in terms of uh, how we fully adopt uh, these uh, financial uh, sustainability reporting standards. Some PNG entities 
are already complying with these requirements, whether because they're part of a global uh, MNC or they're listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and these requirements are already there. So where are we in PNG and what might that look like? Um, so the Sustainability Standards Board um, published these standards in 2023 and like I said, from 1 January 2024, they're now in effect. So PNG, that uh, right-hand column, um, we've got an opportunity to shape our future and be prepared for these new standards. And it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And the way we are looking at it is the compliance costs are significant, so we're not going to recommend that all companies comply. SMEs, for example, MSMEs, for example, we're going to look for exemptions so that they don't need to comply with these standards. But if you're sitting there and wondering, okay, fine, who's going to need to comply with these standards? So large, large emitters. So companies like PNG Power, for example, will be captured by this particular standard. Financial services entities, banks and superannuations, that's a tick, definitely. They will need to comply with these standards. Global MNCs will need to comply with these standards as well. The other thing that I want to just briefly touch on is, yes, it's good that we say you need to comply with these standards and we give you the honours to prepare the reports, give you the honours to measure the greenhouse gas emissions, but we know that we need uh, some policemen to make sure that you're doing it correctly. So after a period of time, once you've gotten used to preparing these, these uh, standards and reports, those reports will actually need to be audited. You know, coming back to my earlier point, today you go to the bank with a set of audited accounts that have been signed off by an auditor. In a few years' time, you will be going to the bank with a sustainability and reporting statement that shows your greenhouse gas emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three, and that report is signed off by an auditor for you to be able to access finance. So this will happen uh, gradually and uh, over time. All right, I'll just finish with this one, one example of what it actually means. Um, um, and I've deliberately chosen superannuation. It could, it could have been a bank. Uh, if you recall my earlier point, the biggest change uh, in the global world we're living in is around the deployment of capital. Super funds and banks control nearly 80% of capital that is deployed for oil and gas projects, for mining projects, for uh, big uh, M&A deals. Therefore, that's why I picked them as an example. So what does that actually mean? Um, so it means as a super fund, you have to consider what are your climate risk exposures, your physical risks, your transition risks. So you need to look through the various investments uh, that you're making if you're a super fund. Are you investing in, um, in traditional mining entities? Are you investing in clean energy? Are you investing in uh, water uh, projects or coal-fired power stations? So as a super fund, you need to consider those physical risks and also the transition risks. And we talked a lot about transitioning decarbonization and moving away uh, uh, and implementing low carbon technologies. Coming back to the scopes, uh, which is what I want to close with, um, just around how do you actually, you know, when you say you need to measure greenhouse gas emissions as a company or as a super fund or as a bank, what, what, what am I talking about? So like I said, there's, there's three types of uh, greenhouse gas emissions that the standards mandate that you measure. So there's scope one, which is the direct emissions from your uh, activities that you control. For Superfund in PNG, it could be from the printing that they do, it could be from the cars that they have, it could be the flights that they take to do member services uh, in the different provinces. So that's scope one. Probably very easy to measure, yeah? You know what you're doing, so you can easily measure that. Um, scope two, again, probably easy to measure. It's about indirect greenhouse gas emissions from the generation or purchase of acquired electricity. So how much are you spending on your electricity bill? How much are you spending on your genset? So again, probably easy to measure. 
The difficult one to measure is what they call the scope three uh, emissions. And this is a typical super fund. The scope three emissions account for 88% of the greenhouse gas emissions that a super fund need to disclose. So you might be wondering, but how? Why is it 88%? Because scope three is about your value chain. What do you have invested um, that might contribute to greenhouse gas emissions? So if you're a super fund and you're investing in a coal-fired power station, for example, that means your greenhouse gas emissions go up. If you're a bank and you're lending to a copper mine, your greenhouse gas emissions go up. So what this means is that scope three is going to be the biggest one that banks and super funds look at when they want to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. That's why capital now is deployed to cleaner fuel sources, because they are trying to reduce scope three. Scope one and scope two, pretty immaterial to a super fund, pretty immaterial to the bank. But when you get to scope three, it's about who are you lending to? It's about who are you investing in as a super fund. That's why those decisions are starting to get a bit tricky. They're just not investing. You read the newspaper, there's a shareholder uh, uprising because the shareholders want super funds, want banks to invest in companies that do not contribute to more greenhouse gas emissions. Lastly, there's significant benefits when we get it right. There is increased investor confidence, we attract investment, we have access to capital. So for P&G companies, being at the forefront of sustainability and climate related disclosures, embedding that within our organizations, will give our investors confidence to invest more money. Just like when you present a set of audited accounts and it's been audited by an accounting firm, maybe a big four, it gives the investor confidence to put in more money. I'll end there and say, the last one I'll say is, in our communities that we live in, um, having transparency around greenhouse gas emissions is also important to build those stronger uh, community relationships and customer loyalty. Thank you.